Well, good morning again. It is good to be back with you all. Been an exhausting couple of weeks, and I was talking to my sister yesterday, and uh, we're both still exhausted. You know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm ready for a nap. Uh, so not up to full capacity yet, but things are good. My dad's funeral went as well as could be expected, and the timing of the funeral and the wedding were absolutely wonderful. Uh, just, you know, I was placing bets on whether he would die during the funeral, during the wedding, or, you know, when would it be, and, and the Lord worked it out perfectly. Uh, and my mother is doing well, as well as she can, as can be expected. And I expect now that my dad is gone, she will thrive like never before. And I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing that joy in her voice again. I see good things for her in her remaining days. Uh, besides being exhausted, I guess I, I kind of find myself in a bit of a fog as well. And I understand the grieving process. Uh, but I also understand that for me, my father's death is the end of really 52 years of grieving. Uh, from my perspective, I literally ran, literally ran through a glass door to try and stop him uh, from leaving to go find work in the north. Um, but he went and found work and we moved and to a new job in a new city with a different side of the family. Uh, my, you know, and it was the end of the family that I knew, if that makes any sense, the age of five. Because from there, my father started working all the time. Most of my childhood, he worked 80 hours a week. Well, you can't really get to know someone you never see. And so at the funeral, when people were telling me what a good man my father was, and he was a good man, I'm not saying that at all. He did some wonderful things for me, pulled me out of a bunch of jams. But I didn't know my father, because he wasn't a father. He was a friend to a lot of people, but he was never there. Um, and so I've been grieving the loss of my father for a long time. And my father used to tell me that after we moved north, my mother cried every day for six months because she got she moved away from her family we moved to his family uh, what he failed to realize was that his quiet obedient son was so devastated by the move that he started working towards numbing himself during that same six months see dad got to go to work i had to hear my mother cry every day for six months uh, we moved four times the first three months we were there. Uh, switched schools three times. At five, I remember walking with a neighborhood kid. Probably, I was probably six. He was a little older than me. And we walked a mile through a drainage ditch under the busiest highway in central Illinois at the time. Over to the other side because my mom was doing laundry over there. Uh, and she was furious, but she didn't grab me in her arms and hold me close because I did a dangerous thing. She didn't put me in the car and take me home. She told me to go home. So I got walked back underneath the <laughs> interstate, or it wasn't interstate, it was just on the highway, and walked another mile back home. I was six. Uh, I was in... I was inching my way towards starting to numb myself. See, I can relate very well to Lauren and to my grandson. Uh, and within five years, by the age of 10, I was learning how to get high on endorphins and lust. And at the same time, I was working my way to being an evangelical zealot. Those things worked together for me. I was becoming a New Testament Pharisee that I would have to later be delivered from. But God did not abandon me like I perceived that my family did. My family didn't abandon me either. just felt like it. And I've told you this before, but at the age of 19, I remember praying a simple prayer. It's at parking lot at Illinois State University. I said, God, do what you've got to do to make me like you. And if I'd have known 
what he was going to do, I would have probably said, never mind. Okay? Except that it is the best thing that ever happened to me, but it was also the most painful thing that ever happened to me. I meant it. And I went on with my life. I did not know that it would take over 30 years for me to be able to see the answer to that prayer, the effects of that prayer. The first thing he did was to bring me to the end of myself. He lifted me up high from my perspective. That first 10 years after that, I was on the road to success. So I thought so, you know. Started pastoring, um, started a record label. I was talking to and making deals with some of my musical idols. I moved to Nashville. And with a year, within a year of moving here, I lost everything. Family, company, money, self-respect. I was higher than a kite on lust and endorphins, and I was really, really mad at God for letting that happen to me. Why did you let this happen to me? And the answer was, well, you asked for it at 19. But I couldn't hear that then. I was just angry. Because everything I wanted, I got. And then he took it all away from me. Uh, the truth is, God didn't do it to me. I did. I was the one who was high. I was the one who was trying to numb myself from reality. I was the one that was in rebellion. I was the one whose will was being done. And I told God what I wanted, and except for that one prayer, the Pharisee Brad was controlling the shots. I remember how devastated I was when I, my life blew up. I remember going into counseling and entering a 12-step program. I remember realizing that I was truly powerless. Powerless. The exact opposite of what I thought I wanted to be. I began to learn to make hard choices that were good for me. See, being high all the time meant that there was never any pain. I didn't have to feel pain. And life is full of pain if you're going to really live it. It meant growing up. And I hated that even worse than I hated pain. I don't want to grow up. Uh, I hated being sober for the first two or three years. You know, everybody's out, it's like, great, you're sober, that's wonderful. Most people didn't even know I was high, but you know, people that did say, oh yeah, you're, you're sober. Well, guess what? I'm feeling pain at the age of 32 for the first time in my life. I had been so numb that nothing could take the smile off of my face. Everybody thought I was just a happy, really good guy. I was just hired a kite. And life is good when you don't feel pain. But when you decide that it's time to face reality, pain rolls over you like a tank. And I mean things I should have learned at the age of five or six. I was having to learn at the age of 32. It was not fun. I wanted to climb back into the numbness. But by the grace of God, even though I stumbled from time to time, I kept moving forward. You see, the grace of God does not make life easy. The good news does not make everything okay. It opens the door to reality and gives you the strength to take one step at a time down the path of life. It gives you the strength to leave death, the death that you love with all your heart and begin to embrace life. You can't have it both ways. Death and life are incompatible. Numbness in life are incompatible. I made the choice to be the first one in my family to become sober. I, I uh, got to talk with lots of relatives, but I got to talk with my, I, I guess the best way to, he's a cousin, but he's really my half-brother by a different mother, if that makes any sense, because him and my dad are identical twins. Uh, 
and he's about three years older than I am. He spent his entire life high as a kite. I remember 15, he was already getting high. Uh, and he lost, he'd been married for 37 years and his wife was his rock. And she died, cancer. And he said the last five years, he, you know, he thought he was going to be okay, but he realized that she held him together and that he had all this stuff. And he's finally sobered up. He was encouraged by that. You know? Um, but it helps me to realize it wasn't just me. I was just the first one in my family to sober up. My sister followed not long after. She was on a different kind of thing, but she began to change her life too. Uh, that choice has let me grieve the losses for the past 30 years. I've been grieving the loss of my father for, like I said, 30 years. Spent two entire years grieving at the beginning of that journey. I cried almost every single day for those two years. And I don't mean just a little tear. I mean I had buckets around the apartment. At that time, I was by myself living in an apartment. Uh, I began to walk in the steps of my Lord, who was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And yet at that same time, the old me still ran deep. The hard, hardest battle of my life was not losing my family or getting sober. The hardest battle and the one that I still struggle with the most is being a Pharisee. Self-righteousness is my biggest enemy. I have to continually fall on my knees and repent even today. I have to pray over and over again, not my will, but your will be done in my heart and life as it is in heaven. I have to die daily to what I want because if I don't, I will destroy everything that I have gained and I will lose it all. I say that to say that with the death of my father, I have found a big chunk of closure that I've been looking for for 52 years. And I trust that God is faithful and that His grace is sufficient for my Father. None of us can know an, another person's spiritual condition. We can only guess. And I pray that my Father who loved the Word of God and taught me to love the Word of God um, by bribing me to read the Word of God, that's the way my father worked. You know, I'll give you $5 for every chapter of the book of Ephesians you read. I don't know how I made at least five. I probably, there was only five. He, he was wise, there were only five chapters. Uh, but what that did was that made me love the Scriptures. I was probably 12, 13 when he did that. Um, So, you know, I forgave my father a long, long time ago. I had to do that, go and do the 12 steps. That's right on the top of the list. You got to forgive those people, who, you know, who you hate in your heart. And so I forgave him. And, you know, last time, the time before, I went and I saw my dad. He was in the nursing home and I told him I loved him. Uh, that word didn't, he didn't know how to say that word. But I told him I loved him. And he said, you too, or something like that. That word just, just wouldn't roll off of his tongue very well, you know. Uh, but I know what he meant, and I knew that he meant it. He loved me the best way he knew how. Might not have been very good, but it was the best he knew how. Uh, and I thank God for him. I thank God for the grace and mercy uh, to be healed, for broken relationships to be healed and to be delivered from death from the inside out. Anyway, with all of that said, let's look at Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 13. 
Jesus went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. I think we also know him as Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Let's stop there. Here we see again someone leaving their job to follow Jesus. He's probably not following Jesus to receive the forgiveness of sin, but because he wants to be a part of the promised kingdom. And as a result, he gets his sins forgiven. Now, I really don't think we understand the magnitude of following Jesus in our culture. The good news of the kingdom is not an insurance policy that you can cash in after you live your life as you want and be happy. Ah, uh, the good news of the kingdom is that you are no longer the king of your life. You are no longer in charge. And Matthew and James and John and Peter and Andrew are the first four disciples that we see in Mark. I don't know if he's going to do the rest of them or not. I can't remember. But they all left their jobs. They were so committed to following Jesus. Jesus has all authority and power over heaven and earth, and you get to choose whether you submit to his authority or not. You get to choose if you will die to your will so that you can live under his. His kingdom come, his will be done as it is in, in your life as it is in heaven. So we, we have so watered down the good news of the kingdom that it really doesn't resemble what we see in the Bible at all. Nobody gives up their livelihood to follow Jesus anymore. And even if they surrender to the call of ministry, they expect to be paid well for their service. What's happened to us? I, I don't really have an answer. I just feel like we needed to ask the question. Jesus... In Jesus' day, it was all or nothing. In verse 15 we read, And as he reclined at the table in the house of Matthew, Levi, the money changer, tax collector. Let's stop and put that in context. Matthew was basically an extortionist working for the enemies of God. The Romans. Who John would call in the book of Revelation the great whore Babylon. That's who Matthew was working for. He was a Jew, but he'd already crossed sides working for the Romans. And as a tax collector, money changer, whatever, he could ask whatever, he, he could demand whatever money he wanted from you and rake off everything that for profit and just give the Romans what they wanted. But he, the people were at his mercy. He was a traitor in the church of his day. In some ways, it would be like uh, being a money launderer for the mob. That's probably closer to what the church of Jesus' time thought about people like Matthew. They were money launderers for the mob. And Jesus goes to this mobster's house and invites all of his mobster friends and their girlfriends, who might have very well been whores, and has dinner with them. That is the context in the culture. Well, we don't ever think like that. Jesus wouldn't hang out with those people. Well, guess what? Matthew is giving up a life of luxury, pleasure, and prominence to follow Jesus. He is expecting more than the forgiveness of sins. He understands that Jesus is promising the promised kingdom of the Old Testament, the Jewish hope of a king who will rule over the earth conquering the splintered kingdom of the world of the accuser, Satan, and placing it under a single and unified rule of God. See, uh, never mind. Uh, Matthew is looking for a shift in power to take place, and he's willing to give up everything for that possibility. So Jesus is eating and talking with the equivalent of mobsters and their friends, or at least, if that's too bad, then at least politicians and their friends. Well, the politicians are already friends with the mobsters anyway, so it's not really that much difference. Uh, you take your pick. Uh, in the text, they're referred to as tax collectors and sinners. 
And they're sitting around the table and eating and probably talking about the kingdom of God. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I used to read this passage about the scribes and Pharisees with contempt. I had contempt for them. Actually, it was double contempt because not only did I have contempt for the scribes and Pharisees, I had contempt for the uh, tax collectors and sinners as well. I was a New Testament Pharisee. I could equally hate everyone. Uh, equal opportunity hater. I still have to fight that demon, and it is a demon or a spirit if you prefer. It's the demon that tells me that I can trust my interpretation of Scripture to be right no matter what anybody else says. And I can trust my interpretation of Scripture to save me from this world and from being both like the sinners and the Pharisees when the Scripture says I'm just like both of them if left to myself. It is rooted and grounded in self-righteousness. The self-righteousness of my years of study and gathering knowledge of the Scripture, learning that I have to let all of that go, has perhaps been the most difficult part of my journey. Running a close second to that is learning to love the people that the Scripture calls sinners and Pharisees. People who are in the midst of their rebellion. And at the same time, learning to trust that God can be trusted to do the right thing. See, sometimes I don't think God can be trusted to do the right thing. I mean, he let a girl who's not just barely going to be 19 die. How can God be trusted? God can be trusted because God gives us the freedom to do what we want to do. And nobody ever is going to be able to say, why did you let that happen, God? And he's going to say, I gave you the freedom to do what you wanted to do. You did it. Don't ever point the finger at me. Anything that comes your way is your choice, not mine. My choice for you is that you'd humble yourself and walk with me, but you refuse. I'm not going to force you to love me because that's not love. You know, I, I, I'm getting better at trusting God to do the right thing. But it's hard. It's hard when you have children. It's hard when you have grandsons that kill themselves. It's hard when you, you know, live in a world that we live in. See, I want God's grace and mercy to look like my version of grace and mercy, which is like all those fairy tales we read, happily ever after. I want you to know that is one of the greatest lies that we've ever been told. There is no happy ever after in this life because this life is the result of us turning our backs upon happy and righteousness. And the result is we are reaping what we have sown in this world. And there's no us and them, it's we. I want you to understand that. There are no good and bad in this world. There are only humbled and unhumbled. And neither one of them did it on their own. You didn't get humbled because you were such a great person. God drove you to your knees and you had to cry out, God, help me a sinner. See, because if you were righteous, then Jesus didn't die for you. You need to understand that. If you are good, Jesus didn't die for you. Jesus dies for you for sinners and sinners alone. And unless you can fit in that category, you're never going to be saved. I don't need to be saved. We're all good on the inside. Yeah, right. Um, see, I want to put people to be under my justice, under my righteousness. I want them to tell my line something that I can't even do. I want to make people do what I can't even do. But the love of Christ isn't like that at all. He loves the sinner as a sinner. 
Do you, do you realize that when Lauren took that last whatever snort or whatever it was of heroin, that Jesus was loving her when she did it? And it broke his heart when she did it because she could have repented, but she refused to humble herself for the living God. I'm, that breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Because I see children falling off the cliff all the time like lemmings. They just follow after each other. I don't know where that first group went, but let's keep going. We don't learn anything because we don't want to repent. And repentance is the only thing we need to learn. God loves the sinners as sinners. And until we figure that out, we're not going to be doing very good at rescuing the sinners. You know, in the midst of, the, of his love for the sinner, he asked them to die to their sins because of the great love that the Father has for them. That's what Jesus Oh, please, I love you so much. Just die to yourself so you can live. And 99% of people say, no, I won't die to myself. I want my... Uh, Eric keeps me up on some things. And, uh, there's a band called Corn, right? And one of the guys in Corn became a Christian. And I mean, he is sold out for the Lord. I saw him at a conference that I went to a couple years ago. And he was getting prayed for, and he's learning how to pray for something. But the lead singer of Corn, he, he had left Corn for a while. He got back into it, I think, because he probably wanted to minister to his friends. They were his childhood friends. He, they grew up together. Uh, but the lead singer has now released a solo album. And tell me what he says. I can't remember. Is it, I will not bow down? Yeah. yeah. So... He's not going to have anything to do with this Jesus and his lordship. I will not bow down is the name of one of his songs. I thank God for his honesty. I wish the rest of the world were as honest. But those little old ladies in the nursing home that have never ever repented are singing the same song. They just sing it in a different tune. I will not bow down. Half or three quarters of the church says that every Sunday. I will not bow down. I won't. I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to give up my job for the gospel. What are you, freaking crazy? Well, I don't know. John and Andrew and Peter and Matthew, they thought it was worth it. Uh, I'm not telling you to quit your jobs. That's the only thing. I'm telling you to die to yourself. I don't know what that looks like. For me, getting a job was dying to myself. I just want you to understand that. The very fact that I have had a job for 13 years is record dying for me. Because I never held a job longer than five years in the first 30 years of my life. Didn't want to have a job. Didn't want to, only wanted to do what was necessary to get by. God humbled me, and instead of me, get, instead of letting me get out of work, He made me work. And then He had the nerve to top it off and make me like it. <laughs> Holy cow! His grace is so much better than my will being done. Hallelujah. Ugh. Why has it taken me so long to understand this? God doesn't hate sinners unless they're proclaiming to be righteous while they're sinning. And even then, they can repent. But those people who refuse to humble themselves, they will be cast into outer darkness. But God is continually pouring out love and compassion over those who knew, know their condition. They know they are sinners, and they want to come home. Well... While we were sinners, Christ loved us enough to die for us. 
That is exactly what Jesus says to these religious theologians. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. If you think you're well, then you go for it. It's all yours. I'm not going to stop you. But anybody you know that thinks they're sick, I'll heal them if you bring them to me. In other words, if you think you're okay before God, you don't need Jesus. You don't need what Jesus is offering. Jesus is saying, if you think you're righteousness, you're wasting your time listening to me because I've got nothing to offer the righteous. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. Come as you are. But know that when you come as you are, you will not remain as you are. Grace will change you. The love of God will change you. But know that it is a long, slow process. See, it's not your job, and I've been saying this a lot ladies, lately, it's not your job to stop sinning before or after you come to Jesus. It's your job to acknowledge your sin and be willing to let it go. It's God's job to pay for your sin and to give you His righteousness. And in the process, change your heart so that you will seek first the kingdom of righteousness and that you will hunger and thirst after righteousness instead of the sin that you want to so easily consume. See, salvation is a diet plan. Really. We consume sin. Jesus wants to change our appetites so that we will consume righteousness. Uh, but we're addicted to our food eating, our sin eating. And God wants to deliver us from that. But we cannot deliver ourselves. We are powerless to do so. Uh, time we stop looking around us to find sinners and start looking inside of us to asking God to bring his kingdom into existence here in our own hearts continuing on with verse 18 we read now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to him why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast but your disciples don't fast and Jesus said to them can wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Because there's a party going on. That's basically what he's saying. You don't fast while you're at the wedding party. The day will come, though, and the bridegroom will be taken away. And then they'll fast in that day. It's important that we understand that the bridegroom is no longer with us. I know he, he said he would be with us even to the end of the age, and technically he is, but he is not here physically. He has sent his representative, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to fill in for him until he returns, but he hasn't returned yet. And I say that to let you know that that means we need to be fasting. The bridegroom is not here. And we are his disciples. We need to be fasting. From the way Jesus, uh, that Jesus talks in this passage, fasting is essential to furthering the kingdom. Jesus fasted. He is our example. I think more often than not, the body of Christ has, settled, has, has kind of settled for salvation from the discount bin. We don't want it to cost us too much. We're really spiritual misers when you think about it. We don't want to spend much and we seem satisfied with less than scraps from the table from the goodness of God. How, what do you mean less than scraps from the table? Well, I say less than scraps because the Gentile woman in the Gospels received scraps from the table and her child was healed. That's a scrap from the table. We don't even want that kind of scrap. We don't even believe that those scraps even exist anymore. Oh God, we're not going to get healed. It's not going to happen. We don't want scraps from God's table. I'm sorry. That breaks my heart. Uh, in this relationship with King Jesus, you get what you pray for. And fasting is an essential part of prayer. Jesus fasted and prayed before he received power 
from God. He went away to fast and pray from time to time. He would even, God forbid, get up at daybreak or before daybreak and go out. Now, maybe that's pushing it a little too far. No, it's not. See, his life wasn't his own. He was doing what his father asked him to do. He would go out to be still so that he could know that God was. We can't, we live in a world that does, that hates stillness. It's because we hate knowing that God is. But the scripture says we need to be still. Still in our minds. Have you ever tried to sit and be still? You know, it doesn't happen automatically. You have to learn how to still your mind, how to stop ideas from bouncing around there. And just rest in who you are, where you are. Rest in the present. Be still. And the scripture says, you'll know that God is. Uh, we're too busy trying to live life to the fullest to fast and pray. The disciples gave up living life to the fullest. And when Jesus went away to be with the Father, they learned how to fast and pray. They waited for power from on high. We don't want to wait for anything. And the result is we get what we fast and pray for. Thus the miserable state of the church today. Not just here, but in the entire country and most of the world. We look at the money that we're spending to save the lost. It's probably billions of dollars a year. Right? I would say at least. And the glorious buildings and educational institutions we have built, we look to the history of the Reformation and we say, we are rich. We have prospered. We need nothing. Not realizing that we are wretched, pitiful, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The church has become a business and the kingdom of God is no longer here at hand. May God have mercy on us that we may turn from our be will being done and our kingdoms being advanced to His kingdom being the only thing that matters. Let's pray. Oh, Father, cause us to hunger and thirst for Your kingdom and then let it unfold in our midst. May we see Your will be do being done in our lives as it is in heaven. May your presence transform our hearts so that we hunger and thirst after righteousness and turn our backs on death, the death that we currently love with all our hearts. Save us from ourselves and unto you. I ask this in the power and authority of Jesus the Messiah, Master of heaven and earth. Please make it so. Amen.